Good morning, Mulaweni, Huyamora, Honorable Members of the Department of Health, Dr. Karim, Mrs. Henry, Professor Miji of Stellenbosch University, our ISPO President, Professor Rajiv Hanspal, members of the ISP Board, members of the World Congress Committee, of the Local Organizing Committee, and of the International Committee, representatives of our esteemed metal sponsors, Otto Bock, Ossa, and all our trade expo participating companies, our support organizations, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my pleasure this morning to welcome you on behalf of ISPO South Africa to this, the 16th World Congress, being hosted for the first time on the African continent and in the beautiful city of Cape Town. This morning brings to fruition an 11-year journey for ISPO South Africa. Our journey to bring this Congress to you, the Congress delegates, began in the year 2006, and this morning becomes a reality. Our scientific committee, under the leadership of Professor Ed Lemaire, have put together an outstanding scientific program which I invite you to take full advantage of. Furthermore, Leipzig and Messe have brought to Cape Town the latest technology in the field of rehabilitation from around the world, which is on display at the trade exhibition. I trust that you will, over the next four days, renew old friendships, make new ones, and enjoy fully all that is on offer both on the scientific front and on the social. Furthermore, we have on offer an outstanding array of post-Congress sightseeing tours and safaris, which I encourage you to enjoy. I wish you an awesome four days of learning and sharing and an unforgettable South African and African experience. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our ISPO president, Professor Rajiv Hanspal, who will present his president's address. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you Professor Hanspal. Dr. Karim, Ms. Henry, guests, members of ISPO, ladies and gentlemen, may I, on behalf of the Executive Board and the International Committee of ISPO, extend my welcome to all those who have come here and helped. Traditionally, the first presentation of our opening ceremony is the President's address when he reports on the activities over the last two years. However, we have all that printed, published, and in your delegate bags in the form of a published report. I do not wish to bore you by repeating that here. I'm also aware that you are all stuck indoors in this auditorium. So, no matter how good this place may be, I will, I, I sympathize with you stuck here and the, and the outside lovely city of Cape Town. So I have decided that I will rather show you pictures of this city. This is the well-known Table Mountain at sunrise. The next slide shows you the Kirsten Bosch Gardens and uh, in the eastern foothills of the Table Mountain. Uh, 
I'm not sure if that really is an oak tree, but I will just pretend it is one. Our society started with a few hundred uh, national, a few hundred delegates, a few hundred members, with only three national member societies, UK, USA, and Nigeria in this continent itself. And yet, it has taken us 57, 47 years to come back to this uh, continent. This is an aerial view of Robben Island. And you can note the saying of Nelson Mandela. Education remains the main thrust of our society's activities. Most of the details are there in the biennium report, but of particular note is the revision and updating of the education standards that PNO, that is alongside a review of the PNO profession with the ILO classification. There is a dedicated session and symposium on the subject at this Congress. Perhaps lesser known to most of you over here, this is the Kruta Skier Hospital in Cape Town with the Devil's Peak in the background and the place where exactly 50 years ago Professor Christian Barnard performed the first human heart transplant in this city, in the world actually. Our scientific committee, maybe the youngest of our standing committees, but it is soon becoming the busiest of all the, all the committees that we have, with about eight or nine current projects, again, all listed in the biennium report. This picture shows the great domed Edwardian building that was once the University of Good Hope, then the South African National Library, which moved to Pretoria, and the building is now known as the center for the book. It is a national monument. Our publication committee is responsible for several publications that includes the POI journal, that is the leading peer-reviewed journal for prosthetics and orthotics. The citation index has been rising, and last year we had to increase the number of pages to accommodate the increasing number of submissions that we get. This is a picture of Boulders Bay along the coast and our home to uh, many penguins. Helen Keller quite rightly said that alone we do so little, together we can do so much more. We have collaborative arrangements through our open board. I had a meeting with all of them mm -hmm. yesterday evening, all internationally recognized organizations and you, with similar goals, and you can see the list of them there. We take corporate governance very seriously, including preparing our strategic plan done last year, and our strategic plan is based on four pillars, advocacy, education, training standards, and innovation. Just like the four pillars in this picture of the new National Assembly Building in Cape Town. For some, I suppose it's wine and vineyards that would interest them most. This is a picture of Groot Constantia, the oldest functioning vineyard in South Africa. I would like to acknowledge the interim staff at ISPU for preparing the biennium report. Like any scientific presentation, I will say, I, will, uh, I have to submit a declaration and I will say, I can assure you that nobody, that I have not received anything in kind 
particularly from any tourist board for this presentation. Questions? No. However, I am sure that most of our members of the executive board will be happy to talk to you about any aspect over coffee, lunch, drinks, or dinner. That concludes the, scientific, uh, the president's biennium report, and I move on to the program at this World Congress itself. It is as colorful and varied as the houses in Bokarp area of Cape Town, originally known as the Malay Quarters and traditionally a multicultural area. I would like to point out that every single paper that, has been, that is being presented here has been reviewed by an independent panel before being accepted for presentation. There are over 500. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the diamond sponsors, Otto Bock, and the gold sponsors, Osser, for their support at this Congress. This is a view from the top of Table Mountain. Our top lecture every year, every biennium, is the Knud Jensen Lecture. This is a picture of our first executive board in 1970, and in the center there is Dr. Knud Jensen, whose vision it was to form this society, and he is the founder. A personal note from me is that on Knud Jensen's left is Professor George Murdoch, who was also the second president of this organization, and I have the honor of having been his registrar at the time when he was the president. Anyway, moving on to the current lecture, I would like to invite Claude Tardif to present this year's Knud Jensen lecture. The subject of his talk is improving access to services for mobility devices how to achieve it in low-income countries. Claude, would you like to come up? And I think I'm right in saying that this is also probably the first Knud Jensen lecture that will not start in English. Am I right? So, as um, Rajiv said, I will start in English, but I will take, I will take the time to say a few words in French. So, um, I don't know how many people among you speak French, but uh, Africa is also, there's a lot of French-speaking country in Africa. And also, you know, in this type of Congress, we don't speak very often French. French is my mother's tongue, and it's a good break for me. And it's more easy for me to start in French because I feel much more comfortable. Okay. <laughs> so I will now switch to French. Don't worry for those who don't understand. It will not be too long. Just a few words. Okay, just to acknowledge that it's an international conference. And international, we should be able to speak uh, several languages. Donc, c'est avec plaisir et avec honneur, en fait, que j'accepte, que, que j'ai accepté de faire cette présentation, cette lecture. Hein, ça, à l'ouverture du congrès, c'est un grand honneur hein, pour ma donne euh, ISPO. En même temps, c'est un stress parce qu'il y a tout le monde qui regarde. C'est le début du congrès et il faut que, que ça soit suffisamment intéressant pour vous maintenir, euh, pour s'assurer que vous allez rester et participer de manière euh, active pour le restant du congrès. So I will now switch back to English. Okay. <laughs> so like that, I will make sure that there is more people understanding what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> So first, I would like to, uh, to say that I'm delighted that I've been chosen to deliver the New Clinton Lecture at this eight, uh, 16 World ISPO Congress, 
which has been said before, first time in Africa, and also first time that we started in French. <laughs> but Africa is also, I think, the continent as such, okay? Africa is a continent that are facing many challenges in trying to make um, assistive products and mobility devices in particular, okay? Accessible, affordable, and to a greatest number of people. They're facing challenge, but it's also, and I'm using challenge and not difficulty, because challenge, for me, have a much more positive um, impact. Because if there's a challenge, I have the impression that it's also bringing a momentum to find a solution to overcome the challenge. While if it is a difficulty, uh, I, I find it a little bit more, less um, positive. So it is a country facing challenge, but it's also a continent who is also implementing different type of intervention, different type of initiative, initiative to make sure that the barrier will be overcome one day. May not tomorrow, maybe not in one week or in two weeks, but there are many, many things happening in Africa. And I hope that those who are not um, necessarily working on your daily practice in low-income and mid-income country, you will take the time to go to some of the lecture and symposium during the week so you can be, so you can learn what's happening and you could probably find a way where you could also put your input and try to, as was mentioned, to work together to try to find uh, or to support or try to find a solution and, um, and way of making sure that nobody will be left behind. And the, the nobody left behind will come several times in my presentation because I think it is also important. It's linked to the sustainable development goal, okay, that no one within the society should be left behind. And people with disability in many countries uh, are probably in the situation at the moment where their chance to be left behind is more greater than other person in the uh, society. But by having access to uh, quality mobility device and assistive products, we can hope that they will not be left behind, but will be an active participation in the society and community. When, when ISPO contact me to uh, tell me that, or to offer me to uh, conduct the lecture, I was honored first, yes, was always honored, but then I start to look back why they choosing me? Because you know, so I need to look at what was my 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 professional journey from the moment I graduated in Canada in 1988, where I saw myself as an individual prosthetic orthotic professional providing services to today, standing in front of you and addressing to you as a, as somebody as which, according to ISPO, have positively contributed to the development or to the thinking around uh, the, the mobility device services. So I said, okay, but why, why I can explain the process where I am now standing in front of you? And I think one of the major thing is that in 1988, 19, 19, 19, when I graduate, I see myself as one individual participating or providing services, okay? And now, in 2017, I see myself more. I'm not, I don't see myself as a piano professional. I see myself as a, more a member of a wider community, okay, who is working together or trying to work together. It's not always easy, okay, and trying to find sustainable solutions to make sure that more people will have access to mobility device over the time. So after the introspection period, when I, and I have to look at what would be the topic of my, uh, of my lecture. Of course, many topics came in and out and it, and out, and it took me quite a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of pressure from ISPO to let them know what would, have been, <laughs> what would be the subject of my lecture. Finally, I decided to choose how barrier will, could be overcome to make sure that more people will have access to mobility device services. And when I talk about mobility device services, I'm not only talking about provision of the device as such, prosthesis, orthosis, walking aid, wheelchair, but I'm talking more about a system, okay, that making sure that the, 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 the impact of the intervention will have a greater impact 
by making sure that the people have access to the device, the therapy they need it, that the system is functioning, they have funding with side of, with side of it. Okay, it's a, it, it, you cannot separate. It's easy to provide the device. It's much more complicated to make sure that the person have access to the other needed services around. Okay, to make sure that they will be, he or she will be able to use, to have a maximum use of the device as such. Okay. So, uh, so when I decide to use this, I say, okay, but I need to explain why I choose this subject. I think the first reason is has been the, it has been the, the focus of my close to 20 years working with the ICIC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and for those who don't know the ICRC, you can see our emblems and flag in the back. Okay? So we, the ICRC is an international and neutral organization which aim at, uh, from a humanitarian point of view, to protect and assist people affected by conflict and other situations of violence. So it's, we are a huge organization. We are doing many, many things. And among this is we support uh, we have been, since 1979, been increasingly involved in trying to, well, in, in improving access to mobility device services worldwide, okay? Through the ICSC Physical Rehabilitation Program or through the ICSC Movability Foundation, okay? And all together each year, okay, it's close to, or a little bit less than half million people who do have access to the network of, have access to services within the network of uh, the center that we are working with worldwide. So this is ending my ICRC uh, publicity, okay. Okay. Secondly, I think access to mobility device or mobility device services is also important from both a human right point of view and the UN Convention on the Right of Person with Disability, with entry in force in 2008, okay said that state party to the convention, and there's 173 countries who have ratified the convention, to, should take effective measures to make sure that people with disability have access to rehabilitation and mobility and assistive product. Uh, okay, which they, they ratified the convention, but they are still, still not completely fulfilled the purpose of the convention. There's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that, um, that uh, this will be achieved. And as mentioned before, okay, so access to mobility device services also have an impact on the, the human development capacity, okay, and the, 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 um, the sustainable development goal, which mentioned that no one should be left behind until the agenda was run until 30, 2030, if I'm not misunderstanding and miss, missing, okay. So by the end of 2030, nobody should be left behind worldwide. So there's quite a lot of work to be done, okay? And one of it, one of the pillars, or one of the, uh, I would say one of the positive things that we can do is to make sure that more people have access to appropriate, quality, affordable, available, affordable, okay, uh, mobility device services. Because I will talk a bit later, later, but the affordability of the services will be one of the main barriers which are stopping people to have access to services. The WHO Global Disability Action Plan, okay, which ran from 2014 to 2021, okay, okay, is also calling the state member, the state member of the WHO, to, uh, to among different things, but to strengthen and extend rehabilitation and assistive device and supporting services within their own country. I will not talk about it because I think there will be some presentation uh, during the week, okay. There's also the GATE initiative, which has been initiated also by uh, by WHO. Who it is called the GATE mean the Global Collaboration on Assistive Technology is also trying to bring people together, okay, and to work towards one direction to make sure that assistive products became not only uh, I would say not only available but accessible to a more greater number of people. Okay? And again. During the week, there is two gate symposium today, if I don't, rem if I remember well, okay. And I'm not the best person to talk about the gate, but I think it is something which is very important, and you should take the time to attend the symposium to know the dynamic that has been created with gate. Okay. 
Finally, one of the main reasons that I have decided to talk about this is also that despite this beautiful framework, the GATE, the CIPD, the WHO Action Plan, despite the work of many organizations, ICIC and other organizations, okay, access to mobility device services remain and in some time impossible, okay, very difficult for many people around the world. Okay? And I will not say not only in low and mid-income country, but it's sometimes also in high-income country where the system as such do not make sure that everybody will have access to services because if you're not working, you don't have access to the insurance, there are no social benefit, strong that you make sure that everybody is there. It is true that in mid-income and low-income country, the problem is probably greater, okay? but we should not forget that also in high-income country, there is also people who do not have access to services. So, but now we have the framework. There's a lot of challenges. Okay, there's many documents. We are uh, listening all the, the different challenges that we can face. Challenges that we can face in all this country. So, among all these challenges that people know about it, I have select some of them which I believe. Uh, are the most important. The first one is probably the fact that disability at large and, and assistive product mobility device is facing is where in low-income country there's many priorities. There's many, you know, if you have a limited budget, okay, you have to, tr you try to put your budget where you have the bigger or the stronger impact for your population, okay both economically but also politically because they are politicians so they, are, they want to be reelected, so they have to want to show that they have two things. And the difficulty about <coughs> rehabilitation, about assistive products, about mobility device is we don't have, there is not strong evidence-based data okay, allowing us to show the positive impact of having access to the type of services both economically for the population, but politically also in terms of uh, showing. So there are some studies which have been done in high-income country, but in low-income country, there's really nothing, okay, or close to nothing. And it's not only to collect data, because collecting data is easy. You need to be able to analyze this data and to put it in a format that we could use it as an advocacy tool, so we can explain to the decision maker, the one who, have de who decide to put the budget on one side, on budget on the other side, there's an added value to put money into the rehabilitation uh, sector. Okay. And this is very difficult. This, I think when, when, I, when I'm traveling for the ICIC, when we're discussing with our different partner, okay, I feel that we, I don't have enough tools really to support what I'm trying to explain to the, uh, to the authority why they have to put money into the system. So the ICIC, we, to, in, part of the answer to this, we have mandated the uh, Center, for, Center for Evidence and Disability of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to conduct a two-year study in Myanmar where, on the impact of having access to uh, mobility device services in Myanmar for a two-year period. The, the study is finished at the moment. They are just writing the report at the moment, and the report should be... Uh, should be available before the end of this year. Okay. The primary results show that yes, there's a positive result and there's a way of proving it okay, from different point of view. And within the report, there will be also a tools that can be used to uh, expand this kind of service, survey in other country. It's good to have advocacy too, it's good to have data, it's good to have uh, element that we can put on the table, but, but we also have to find a way to better disseminate okay, all these guidelines that we are producing, that WHO is producing, ISPO is producing. The, we, we want to make sure that those who are taking decisions to put, to invest money in rehabilitation and mobility device know about this framework, that the framework exists, that some guidelines exist, and to be able to do that, we need to be able to work together, okay? If I see, I see, if I'm going to meet uh, whoever I meet, okay, alone is difficult, I don't have the weight, okay, to really convince. If in one country we are able to have a platform, okay, where 
service user, professional, service provider, the government all sit together, we are much, much more stronger and a bigger impact in trying to change things. Okay, there have been some, some, uh, some, um, some efforts, and Fado Tanzania, my colleague from the Movability Foundation, has worked with the authority of Tanzania to try to put a platform where the different stakeholders can sit together and try to uh, address the issue and develop the sector. If I look in Africa, the African Federation of Orthopedic Technologies, the FATO, okay, which started as a, as a PNO uh, organization trying to raise the profile or the position of the, of the PNO professional, which now have become over the year a strong pan African organization bringing together not only the PNO, but also the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist the service user all together and trying to, to, to work in such a way that, yeah, that things can be moved forward. So they have put in place an observatory of what's happening in a different African country in terms of rehabilitation and mobility design services. It can be national policy. So all these documents become available to the other members so they can be an example of how to build, how to build the, um, the structure. Of course, it's good to have data, it's good to have money to come in, but one of the weaknesses is that there is no structure. The, the, the mobility device service provision are not structured enough. There is no regulation. And what the CRPD is saying, the CRPD, it is that state parties should take effective measures to make sure that uh, rehabilitation mobility device services are available or accessible. But it doesn't mean that the government or the national authority, the, the governmental institution, have to be service provided. They can be, but, they serve, but their role is more to regulate and structure the center, the, the sector, to make sure that who, it, it's, it's well defined who's supposed to provide the services, what type of professional you need, professional recognition, funding mechanism. So, and all this, you have a box or the five structure where whoever come in to to support or to develop a new service, know where it can be fit into the structure. And this is probably, without this, it's very difficult to go further in the development of a, a sustainable service provision system if you don't have the frame to, to, to put together. And again, even if it is the role of the government or the responsibility of the national authority to develop this frame, uh, frame and regulation, okay, it cannot be done by themselves. So again, they need to be able to contact all the stakeholders, the user, the service provider, the professional association, to make sure that everybody brings his own input into the system and it's a system that will make sure that everybody, will, the maximum number of people will need access to this type of services will have access to it. And already WHO has produced different um, guideline and yet you have the wheelchair service provision guideline and this week there will be the uh, p uh, &O standard service provision will will be launched during the week okay and these type of documents are good because it gives the frame where you can start talking and put things together okay and then you're making sure that you don't forget anything when you develop the sector there must be must be have some water somewhere or This is a strategy to take a break when talking, so you just... Uh, <laughs> so, I have talked about the necessity to have advocacy tool to push the sector to develop, the need to have a well-structured and regulated sector, okay? But... Sorry, but... Um, we need to talk about money, funding, okay? Because even if we try to, to provide services as, or to limit or to, to control the costs as much as possible, there will always be costs. Okay? Nothing is free. You need to pay the building, you need to pay the professional, you need to buy the materials, the comp there's always be costs. What is the best way to, to make sure that the system that you will put in place is sustainable? I think there is not one solution, there is many solutions. As long as we keep in mind that this, this, the, the, the financial 
or the funding mechanism that you put in place, okay, make sure that this, there are services, the services are available, accessible, affordable, quality, and that nobody is left behind. Okay? Because you could have a perfect structure, very good center, a lot of professional inside the center, a lot of uh, managerial staff to make sure that the system is well managed. If nobody could pay for the services, then it's an empty box. You don't go anywhere. Okay? And the, the, the financial barrier is, is, is the way it's experienced by the service user, by the service provider, and by the national s uh, sector is very different. For the user, it's not only the cost of the services, which is a main barrier, but it's also the cost to reach the service provider. Okay? So in some, I was discussing this morning from, um, from Madame from West Cape uh, Rehabilitation Center, and she was explaining to me how it can be quite an important burden for, for the people receiving services at her center in, in reaching the center, in reaching the service provider and being able to, yeah, yes, the government may pay the device, but the government do not pay to how to reach the center. So, yeah, so, it's a, so you have to find a way. For the service provider, then the financial constraint is more to make sure that the structure that you manage okay, is able to function properly, is able to pay uh, the, the maintenance of the building, the materials that you use within the, your center to pay the salary, to pay the electricity, to that, so minimum cost. And for the structure, of course, the, the financial barrier is more to make sure that you have developed a system, a service delivery system, okay, which is covering the good part of the country, sustainable, and there's enough income coming in to make sure that it continues to function on a long time. And we all know, at least those who are involved in, uh, or close to be involved in service provision, that one of the main barriers for the cost of the services remain the technology. Okay? The cost of the technology, even thought within the last 20 years, I would say, the scope or affordable, or the, the, there's a much more wider variety of technology affordable, uh, available at different prices, it remains okay, a main factor which stopping people from having access to this food mobility device and assistive products. Mm -hmm. I, have, I don't know what is the solution for this. I will probably call the industry uh, to, to say, well, okay, how can we address this? Okay. It's, uh, we all know, we, and I think we all agree that they have to make money, they have to, uh, to continue functioning, but we need to find a way where more technology is available for more people and more people could have access to services because they can Either the system is covering the service provision or they participate in the cost or whatever, but we need to find a solution that the cost of the services remain as low as possible. So I'm trying to, to speed up a bit because I can see the president is moving on his chair, so it's probably because... <laughs> okay. So there's not enough service provider, okay, that's for sure. Okay. But at the same time, to open more center you open, more expensive it is for the country to sustain, more human resources you need, more finance you need. So, yes, we need more center. Yes, we need to find a centralized mechanism to make sure that the center can move. Again, from, from the example from, uh, from the West Cape, uh, Western Cape Rehabilitation Center, where they have teams going in the field and coming back. Okay, it's a way to reach more people. Okay? But at the same time, we all know that it's not possible without having a, a clear plan because you need to have more human resources, you need to have more money, okay? So it's not only, from my point of view, it's not only to make sure that there's more center in the field, but also that the existing center are becoming more efficient, that they are working in a more efficient way, that their impact is greater according to the resources they have, okay? And I do believe there's a lot of work to be done to make the existing center much more efficient in terms of, uh, of having a greater impact in providing more services to more people okay, with the limited resources they may have. Okay. And there's different way of doing this. So now I will conclude because um, I think my time is slowly running out. Okay. Um, and I would like to conclude by two things. Human resources is important, but it's not the only factor. When we talk about human resources, it's not only professional. We, we need professional, but we also need people who are able to lead, to, to manage, 
and to, to, to be able to, to have vision on developing and find a way to develop me funding mechanism. We need to work together. Uh, we need to work together at national level, at regional level, international level, to have one voice pushing in one direction with the same goal. Okay. And we need better data, and not only to collect data or for collecting data, but data that could be used as advocacy tools. So we can ask for uh, the authority or whoever to put more money. So I will finish by saying thanks to many people, because the award is giving to me, okay? But I would like to share this award to all these people, or all the people I have met over my last, uh, I don't want to say how many, long, how many years I've been working, okay? But I have met different people, okay? Which have all contributed to, uh, to, 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 to allow me to become what I am, okay? Of course, there's the service user I have met over the years, okay? We have forced me to think differently. My colleagues from the ICIC, both the international and national staff, the staff of all the centers that we are working with all over the world, okay? And also some individual that I would like to take some time, two minutes, okay, to thank them. Among them, David Constantin, Nikki Simo from Motivation, okay, Christine Kornick, formerly from Motivation, Chapal Kasnabis from WHO, Harold Shengeli from, um, from Tanzania, Isabel Urso from Handicap International, Masti Young, the president of FATO, Kate Wilson from MSH, okay. Ritu Bush from Mobility India, Sar Bart Sarva from, uh, from Pakistan, Jan Kawiza from Rwanda. All these people, I named them separately, and I don't want to make nobody jealous, but these people have been challenging me several times during my career, okay? And I think they should be deserving part of the award also, and not only me. So thank you. Enjoy the Congress. I will invite people who are not necessarily involved in a low-income country to go to the session, okay, and see that there's many things moving in front, and I'm sure you will find a way that you can support the process. Thank you. You have to stay here, you know. Thank you very much. And you know you're going to get a medal here. But in, in uh, the style of the green jacket in Augusta, I'm going to ask Chapal to come over as the previous, previous lecturer, Knudians and lecturer, to present this one. I know the two of them in meetings often have disagreements, <laughs> but all with the same aim, and maybe and maybe this will help them be less contentious. I just would like to say that Chapal and I are our neighbor in Geneva. I see our headquarter is close to WHO headquarter. But we meet more often outside Geneva than we meet. So I have to come to Cape Town to have the chance to have five minute discussion with Chapal. So. This is also an opportunity, perhaps the best opportunity for me to tell you that here, this year, following this uh, World Congress in Cape Town, we have uh, launched the ISPO FATO Council with the hope that they are going to work more and facilitate further rehabilitation in this continent. Uh, Claude was quite instrumental in us reaching uh, to this formation of the council, which has three members from ISPO and three members from FATO, and Claude is going to chair that for us. So thank you again for that. This picture, as you can see, I'm trying to show you some, um, some bits of uh, Cape Town, is the Green Market Square in the center of Cape Town where uh, people from all over Africa come 
with trade, and it's also a, a favorite tourist haunt to pick up souvenirs. This is the Victoria and Albert uh, waterfront, a hub of uh, social activity, a uh, favorite of the tourists, and a lot of restaurants and shops and shopping malls. ISPO has always considered the patient and the user in the center. And this is evidenced by this picture where you have nine-year-old Ula Anderson, who suffered from polio at the age of six months on the 20th of November 1970, putting a stamp on the documents that led to the formation of this society. We have been discussing with IC2A and were delighted when following discussions, they agreed to sponsor and facilitate the IC2A lecture. And this is the first time that we're going to have an IC2A lecture at our opening ceremony. This, those who uh, have been to Robin Island will have seen this cell where Nelson Mandela was held as a prisoner for his anti-apartheid beliefs before being released to become the president of the country. I believe one can consider that some people are imprisoned by their disability and struggling to free themselves is rehabilitation. Giles Dule is our first IC2A lecturer and I am pleased to, to invite him over to the stage. Now, one of a few words while he's coming on here is one of the, his highlights moments was when he read an article in The Guardian about his photographic work and there was no mention at all about his disability. That is recognition for what you are, not for your disability, and I consider that total holistic rehabilitation. His photographic self-portrait is considered to be the third best photographic self-portrait ever. Andy Warhol tops that list. I don't know whether he's going to show that <laughs> picture, but I know and I'm informed that the presentation is titled How a Small Gift Can Change the World. He's extremely busy, has an extremely busy schedule all around the world, and we are honored that he has made time to attend our Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, Giles. Thank you. Can you pass me the, uh, the Good morning, everybody. I have to say, uh, last night, I was sat having a dinner with a group of people. I think there was eight of us on the table and seven legs between us. So I thought, I'm in good company. <laughs> I'm a storyteller. Stories are my life. I follow a rich tradition that started around campfires millions of years ago, that carried on through cave paintings, through the birth of the printing press. And there is no country more rich in that storytelling tradition than South Africa. So I'm honored to be here today to tell stories. My story begins with a small gift, a small gift that was to change my life. When I was 18 years old, um, I'd gone to the States on a sports scholarship. I was the world's worst boxer, I remember my coach saying to me, Giles, you take a punch very well. But I loved it, and I love sport, and I had the sports scholarship. Um, I went there, but unfortunately, within a few weeks of being in America, I had a small car accident. Um, it was nothing too major, but it was enough 
for me to be flown back to London and to be told that I would never do any sport again. As an 18-year-old, I became incredibly angry. My whole life had been about sport, and I had no idea what was going to come next. And this angry 18-year-old lying in a hospital bed, a small thing happened. My godfather, unfortunately, passed away. And when he died, he left me two things. One was an Olympus OM10 camera, and the other was a book by the war photographer Don McCullen. Two small gifts, a tiny gesture, but they changed my life. Lying in this hospital bed, um, I started looking through the work of Don McCullen in this book. He took amazing black and white photographs of the Vietnam War, of famines in Biafra and Bangladesh. And I'd never seen images like these, these black and white stark photographs. And I looked at these photographs, and I decided there and then, that's what I wanted to do with my life. In fact, to this day, if I shut my eyes, I can still see those images etched in my mind. So I actually taught myself photography lying in this hospital bed. I used to photograph all the doctors, the nurses, my friends. Obviously, as an 18-year-old, I mainly photographed the nurses. Um, and I learned photography. And I left hospital full of really good intentions to travel in the world in the footsteps of Don McCullen, documenting conflicts and humanitarian disasters. Um, but I had a few friends that were musicians, were in bands. And they said, why don't you come along and, and photograph some of our gigs? So I did. And really by accident, I found myself as a music photographer. Um, before I knew it, I was getting commissions, um, and I was traveling around the world, photographing all these rock stars from Marilyn Manson to Mariah Carey, Lenny Kravitz. I suddenly had this amazing rock and roll lifestyle, and it was great. But as the years went on, I found myself increasingly unhappy. And I couldn't really work it out because I had this amazing life. Many people would give a lot to be photographing models in Miami, a rock star in New York, and then heading to Paris. And yet I found I would do these shoots, and afterwards I would go to my hotel room and I would cry because I felt unhappy. And I couldn't figure that out. And as the years went on, that depression grew and grew. And I also grew increasingly cynical about the industry that I worked in, the fashion world, the world of celebrity. And so one day, it reached a climax. Um, I was about 28 years old, and in the middle of a photo shoot in London, I had a very rock and roll moment. There was an argument going on between the editor of a magazine and a young actress about her state of undress. And I was sat there and I thought, this is not why I became a photographer. So my rock and roll moment is I took my cameras and I threw them out the window of the hotel and said, that's it, I'm done, and walked out. Well, anybody that knows me knows I'm not that rock and roll. I had a small hissy fit. I threw them on the bed. It's just unfortunate that they bounced out the window. <laughs> but that was the end of my photographic career. At least I thought it was. I was only 28, I moved out of London, and I thought, I've wasted my opportunities. My depression increased. I became very, very lost. And then, at that lowest moment, I remembered that small gift. I remembered the Olympus OM10 camera and the book by the war photographer Don McCullen. And I remembered the impact that those pictures had had on me 10 years before. And I realized that's where I'd been going wrong. I had never really followed my destiny. So I sold my flat, I moved to Angola, and I began a photographic career as a documentary photographer, covering the effects of conflict on civilians around the world. I'd been doing that work for six or seven years when I found myself in Afghanistan. Um, I was documenting the impact of war on a small group of American soldiers. We were out on patrol one day when this happened. This is an image taken moments after I stepped on an IED. I remember I was actually lying in the field at this point. In the tree, I could see my boxer shorts. And I remember thinking, that's not a good sign. <laughs> Miraculously, though, there were some great medics. Um, they rescued me. Um, I was flown to Kandahar, where I received life-saving treatment. Um, and then I was flown back to the UK. I then spent 46 days in intensive care. Um, on two occasions, my family was actually called in to say their goodbyes. At various points, my lungs, my kidneys, virtually every major organ gave up. And yet, miraculously, 
After 46 days, I was still alive. They moved me to a high dependency unit. But this is where things got really hard, because this is when I had to come to terms with my new reality. I'd lost both my legs, I'd lost my arm, I had various internal injuries. I was told I may never walk again. I was told I may need full-time care and support, and there was no question that I would ever work again. Everything that I held precious had been taken away from me. I remember three months after I was injured, I was well enough for the first time to be put in a wheelchair and taken to have a shower. It was the first time I'd seen myself in a full-length mirror. And I was repulsed. I was disgusted by seeing myself. I looked and I did not recognize my body with these scars, my limbs missing. And I remember going to bed in that hospital at night and crying and thinking to myself, you know what, I wish I'd just died on that helicopter in Afghanistan. It would have been so much easier. I could not deal with this new reality. But the next morning, something had changed. Something had twigged in my brain. And again, I remembered that small gift, and I remembered my love of photography. And I said to myself, I will find a way to take photographs again. And if I can take photographs, none of this will matter. If I can tell stories again, none of this will matter. So there and then, I made a decision. I said I would never think about the things I could not do. But I would think about what I could, and I would excel at those things. And the first thing I needed to deal with was how I felt about myself. And of course, the way I was going to deal with that was through my photography. I wanted to do a self-portrait. Before I had uh, gone to Afghanistan, I'd actually been at the British Museum. And in the British Museum, there's some amazing Roman and Greek statues. But most of them are broken. And I remember thinking to myself, but when I looked at them, I just saw the beauty that was still there. I did not see that they were smashed. And that's what I wanted to do in a self-portrait. So my friend came. He uh, literally broke me out of hospital. Um, we went to his photographic studio. I have to say, we did go via the pub. <laughs> and I did this photograph. And this was the moment I took control of my life again. This is the moment when I said, I have no shame of my injuries. I am what I am. But inside, I'm the same person. In fact, inside, I may be better, I may be stronger, I may be more focused. And this was the moment I defiantly said that to the world. After that, um, things got better. I went back to hospital. Um, I had around about 37 operations that first year. And by the end of the year, um, I was able to go to Headley Court in the UK and begin my rehabilitation. Um, eventually, um, after a few weeks there, I was able uh, to walk. They taught me to walk. They also taught me how to make these strange grimacing faces. And before I knew it, um, I was able to hold a camera again. In the months um, after I was injured, literally just a couple of weeks after I was injured, I watched on the news as the war in Syria began. As I went through my rehabilitation and my recovery in hospital, I watched as the war grew more severe. I had friends calling me from humanitarian organizations, and they were saying, Giles, we've seen nothing like this. And so even while lying in my hospital bed, I knew that this was the story, the most important story of my career, and I had to find a way to tell those stories. So when I was uh, able to, and finally able to work again, one of the first places I went to was Lebanon in 2014. I wanted to document some of Syria's most vulnerable refugees, those living with disabilities, uh, the elderly, single mothers, people like Khaloud. Khaloud had been working in her garden in Syria. She was tending to vegetables with her children when a sniper shot her in the spine. She actually fell on top of one of her children. She was paralyzed from the neck down. When I met her, she was living in a makeshift tent in Lebanon, really nothing more than cardboard and plastic. She had no support. Her only carer was her husband, Jamal, who had been basically giving her full-time support. The whole family lived in this one tiny room. I remember saying to Clude, what is your hope for the future? And she said, Giles, I just want to be a mother again. And she would describe to me how when her children were running outside, if one of them fell over and scratched their leg, they would come in and they would pick up her hand and they would put it on the wound, and they would say, Mummy, make it better. 
and it broke her heart that she could not even feel that. On this trip, um, I met Reem. Uh, Reem had been at home in Syria when a rocket hit her house. She lost a leg. Her husband was also killed in the bed next to her. When I met her, she was living on the fourth floor of an unfinished building in Lebanon. And because she was still learning to use her prosthetic leg, she was quite literally trapped on that rooftop, unable to use the stairs. The only person that lived with her um, was her father, Abdel. Now, when I take portraits, I normally take portraits of people looking directly at the camera. But every time I took Abdel's photograph, he kept looking to the side. I eventually said to him, why, why are you looking over there? And we were on this rooftop. And he said, Giles, you see in the distance those mountains? I said, yes. And he said, that is Syria. He said, I'm an old man. I will probably never return home. But at each day when I wake and each night when I go to bed, the last thing I see is my home. I see Syria. And that's why I live on this rooftop. And on this trip, I also met a young girl called Aya. Now, I don't like to photograph people as victims. Victims of circumstance, but not victims in their own right. But when I met Aya, I was struggling. When I met her, I thought, how can I take a photograph of her without making her look like a victim? At the time, Aya was four years old. She had spina bifida, meaning she was paralyzed from the waist down. She was living in a wet, damp tent that was dark. She was virtually sitting in a puddle of water. She was struggling to sit up. I thought, if I take her photograph, she would just look like a victim. So I said to the crew I was with, I said, look, I'm not going to take any photographs of this young girl, but I will spend the day and I'll get to know them a bit better. Well, it turned out that I was completely and utterly wrong. It turns out that Aya is the feistiest four-year-old I've met in my life. She not only ran her family, she ran the whole refugee camp. Um, I discovered it when her sister came in and she looked at her sister and she said, hey, donkey, pick me up. And I followed her around and she refers to everybody in the refugee camp as donkey. Donkey do this, donkey do that, and they do. So after spending a week, I was finally able to take the photograph that I really wanted to. The photograph that captured this incredible girl's spirit. This is Aya playing hopscotch with her older sister, Aman. And she's going, donkey, faster, donkey. I don't think you need to show people as victims. You know, Aya is four years old with spina bifida living in a refugee camp. If you can't work out her life is difficult, you don't need me. But what I like to show is what I find so often, which is the humanity and strength of humanity. Last year, um, I got a phone call from the UNHCR asking me to document the refugee crisis. It was the biggest single project I've ever been given. Uh, eight months crisscrossing Europe and the Middle East. They gave me the most amazing brief, the most amazing commission. They simply said, Giles, follow your heart. So I went uh, to Lesvos, uh, to scenes that many of us are familiar with, with the boats landing, of the disasters happening there. I followed the trail across Germany. But I knew that if I was going to really fulfill that brief and follow my heart, I'd have to go back to Lebanon, and I'd have to trace some of those refugees that I'd photographed two years before. So in 2016, that's what I did. Um, I went back there. Um, I went and saw Reem and Abdel living on the rooftop. Now, one of the things I like to do is to take a photograph back to the people I photographed. But let me tell you, for a guy with no legs and one arm, cutting photographic prints halfway around the world is a pain in the ass. So I get there, I give Abdel his photograph, he looks at it, and he says, Giles, you made me look really old in this. <laughs> I was like, there's gratitude for you. Um, Reem was still living on the rooftop, but she had more of a family uh, together now. She had mastered her prosthetic leg. Um, she was able to go up and down the stairs. But like many refugees, her life is stuck in limbo. Um, she's unable to work. The children are unable to go to school. For four years now, really, they have had no life. On that same trip, I obviously went and I managed to track down Aya and her family. Um, Aya was exactly the same. This is her being pushed by her brother. Of course, she is screaming, faster, donkey, faster. But again, like these other families, they are stuck in limbo, unable to move forward. They are unable to take Aya to the hospital for the most basic uh, medical care. Aya's sisters and brothers can't go to school. Her parents can't work. On the last day of that trip, I got a phone call. 
As I said, I'd managed to track down many of the families that I'd met before, but obviously not everybody. But I got a phone call, and it was from Khalud's husband, Jamal. Khalud is the woman I told you about at the beginning that was shot by a sniper and paralyzed. And I was really excited when I heard Jamal's voice. And he said, Giles, we hear you're in Lebanon. We'd love to see you. I said, great, where are you now? And he said, we're in the same place, the same tent. And I remember that moment so clearly. My heart stopped. I felt sick. I said, where are you? And he said, we're in the same tent where you last saw us. I was so upset. I kept thinking, how could they, the most desperate of all the refugees I'd met two years before, still be living in that same situation? And I thought, well, I told their story. I did my job and nothing has changed. I failed them. The next day, I went to see the family, and when I walked in, I burst into tears, and I said to them, you entrusted me with your story. I told it, and nothing has changed. I have failed you. They said, no, you haven't. They hugged me, and we chatted. But in my heart, I thought, what's the point of taking photographs? What's the point of telling stories if nothing changes? But I decided there was only one thing I could do. I extended my stay there by a week, and I said, I just have to do this, and I have to do it better. So I did, and over the, the coming week, um, I photographed their life. As I say, they live in this tiny, tiny room. There's no window, there's no light, there's no air. For Khalud, she spent two and a half years lying in the same bed, staring at the same ceiling. She has not moved from that bed in that time. And yet, it's a place full of love and laughter. The kids are amazing. They do the homework in bed with their mother. Um, Jamal is... is amazing at cooking, and when he cooks, Khalud always says it's not very good, but just to wind him up. But it's a place like any other family, and they inspire me. On the last day I was there, I had to make a decision. I told you earlier that I normally travel with photographs and take it back to give to the people I photographed. I'd just taken this photograph, and I realized that it was almost a mirror image of the image I'd taken two years before. And I thought, how can I give this to them? This will upset them so much to see that nothing has changed. But I thought, no, I have to give them that photograph. And I did. And I handed them this image. But before I gave it to them, I said, when I took this photograph, I did not take a photograph of a refugee. I did not take a photograph of a disabled woman. I took a photograph of a couple who are so in love with each other. And this photograph is a photograph of that love. Now's the magic part. A few weeks after taking these photographs, I was in San Francisco and I was doing a talk. And after the talk, I had mentioned the story of Khalud and I told them about this photograph of love. And somebody came up to me and they said, do you mind if I share this story? I have a network on social media and stories like this we love to share. And I said, of course, it's a story to be shared. And they did. And it was shared as a photograph of love. And then people started to donate money. And people started to want to make a difference to Kalu's life. And in the space of just two weeks, we had raised a quarter of a million dollars. Now I'm able to put Khalud in a new home. Uh, we've had it adapted. She will be moving actually this week into a new home in the Bekaa Valley. Her kids are back in school, and in some small way, she has her life back. I remember the family once said to me, why are you doing this for us? And I said, because you were the ones that let me tell your story. You were the ones that gave me my life back because they enabled me to become a photographer again. And in some small way, I was just repaying them. I started this talk by saying it's about a small gift. 25 years after being given that camera, the ripples of that action were changing lives still. All of you in this room do amazing work to support people like me to be able to do what I do. Each one of you every day is giving small gifts. You are giving these gifts to amputees like myself. Now, you may never see the results of that, but believe me, the ripples of your actions are changing lives 
across the world. And for that, I am thank you, and I thank you for listening. invite Niels Ott Tonnefold, who's the chairman of IC2A, to present the medal. Thank you, Rajiv, and thank you, Dials. Wow! That was inspirational. You have demonstrated that if there is a will, there is a way. So thank you, Dals, for sharing your inspiring and powerful story, reminding us why we are here, and for setting the tone of the conference. And you ended that so in, re in real life by explaining why it is so important that you all do what you're best at. And uh, it's all about people. It's about pro improving the lives of users. That is inspirational. If anyone have any questions for Giles, he will be at the stand of IC2A, which is located at E08 next to ISPO. He has books there, and he will be able to answer questions, and you can talk to him in person. It is now my pleasure to present the IC2A Inspirational Medal as a token of appreciation for what you have just delivered us. True inspiration. Dial. If my boxing coach could see me now, I was told him I'd wear a medal one day. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. I will come and see you later. Thank you very much for having Well, from Cape Town to Geneva, and this is the broken chair originally commissioned by Handicap International and now a permanent structure in place the nations facing the United Nations building in Geneva. It is meant to symbolize opposition to landmines and cluster bombs. To me, it represents dedication and commitment by all NGOs and organizations and professionals in their attempt to prevent and manage disability. And it is to this extent that WHO has developed the standards for P&O services in collaboration with ISPO and funded by USAID. It is my pleasure to invite Professor Dr. Alarcos Theka, responsible for disability and rehabilitation in WHO, to announce the launch of the standards. Next slide, which is actually a picture of the... It's good, it's good, it's good. Okay. It's good. Okay. So, what a morning. Everything has been said already. So, 18 months ago, Rajiv asked me to commit to an impossible task. He brought me to commit to launch the WHO, ISPO, USAID standards for prosthetics and orthotics here at the ISPO Congress 2017. And it was an impossible task, I can assure you. But as you will know, and as we have here today in the morning, 
Impossible tasks are possible when there are people involved in them that can produce extraordinary work. And that has been the case in these um, standards. It has been the case of the extraordinary work that the authors, Anders Eklund and Sandra Secton, has done, and it has been extraordinary work that my colleague Chapal Kasnavis, as the editor, has done. And I have to admit, Rajit, that you were right. It is good to launch these standards at this Congress. And it is good because it is extremely in line with the theme of the Congress. So we have a surprise because you will see that you don't only have the standards, even to do the tasks more impossible, we have an implementation manual of the standards. And the reason why it is good to launch an appropriate and the right place and the right moment to launch the standards in this Congress is because, as Claude well said, is the narrative about making orthotics and prosthetics available, accessible, affordable, and uh, prosthetics and orthotics products efficient and effective. And you may ask, what is, how many standards are needed to give all this message to achieve that? Huh? I will not tell you now, because the standards will be launched tomorrow in session 33, and you are welcome and invited to it. But also linking what it has been said already today in the morning. To achieve or to come here, the work, extraordinary work by extraordinary people was needed. Now, to implement these standards, the ball is on you, all of you, extraordinary people doing extraordinary work. And it will require for some of you also leaving some own interest behind and focusing altogether on a single goal. But you are all extraordinary people and can do that and implement the standards for available, accessible, and affordable prosthetics and orthotics products for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Well, that concludes the business part of the opening ceremony. And I'd like to invite Dr. Sadiq Karim, Chief Director of General Specialist and Emergency Services, Western Cape Department of Health, to extend a welcome note. Professor Anspal, it is indeed humbling, first of all, to do this welcome um, to Cape Town after such luminaries. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired. Um, I, I stand in awe of the colleagues that spoke before me and actually in all of you um, for the work that you're doing and for, as was said, extraordinary people doing extraordinary work. Um, but on behalf of the executive mayor of the city of Cape Town, uh, Ms. Patricia DeLille, the Minister of Health of the Western Cape Province, the Head of Department, 
it is indeed an absolute honor to in fact welcome you and understand there are more than 2,000 delegates and 100 exhibitors to the city of Cape Town. Professor Hanspal has made my job actually extremely easy. He's shown you what probably I could be saying in five minutes. Thank you for doing that. Um, so Professor Hanspal, Mr. Barkley, this is the first time that you've brought this prestigious International Society for Prosthetics and Orthotics World Congress to the African continent. For that, I thank you. Um, and I thank you for bringing this to the beautiful city of Cape Town. You've seen some of the images of the city. There are many more, and I implore you, when you have time, to do that. You've seen the penguin colonies. It was one of my favorite pastimes, to swim with the penguins. Um, I shall not do what I know half of this audience will be doing. You can dive with the sharks. It's quite safe. And you've got all the right people in the room here if anything does were to happen. So. No, I, I, I tease. A word from the mayor. We are honored to have been chosen as the location for the first ISPO World Congress to be hosted on the African continent. And I believe you will be successful in your aim to raise the profile and awareness of prosthetics and orthotics to further develop services and access to assistive technology. In line with our strategic pillar to build an inclusive city, we place special emphasis on supporting efforts designed to improve the quality of life and participation of disabled persons in our society. And for this reason, we look forward to hosting some of the world leaders in the fields of prosthetics, orthotics, and assistive technology. As part of our organizational development and transformation plan, we are positioning Cape Town as a forward-looking innovative, globally competitive business city. And as such, we remain committed to building an opportunity city that is open for business and a center for ideas in Africa, where the world can gather to plan their growth strategies." Unquote. From what I've seen, heard, read, and heard, it is indeed nothing short of a humanitarian crisis that 90% of people worldwide who need assistive technologies to restore or maintain their mobility, in fact, do not have access to appropriate devices. I like the Congress motto, assistive technology for all, and I believe this is extremely appropriate. I also note the, the Gates Symposium, which I have to comment on, a joint collaboration between the International Society for Prosthetics and Orthotics and the World Health Organization that will highlight global technology issues and improve access to quality, high quality, affordable mobility and therapeutic aids. On behalf of all the dignitaries, the mayor in particular, um, it is indeed an honor to welcome you to Cape Town. Um, I'd like you to take advantage of the opportunity that you have, visit the city. We have beautiful facilities as well. You've heard the Western Cape Rehabilitation Center is in fact, I think, I believe a model of excellence. It's led by Ms. Henry. She is here, and if you'd like to meet with her, I suggest you come, if you don't mind, Jenny, I'm implore <laughs> that you come and meet with her to see what we do in Cape Town um, and the world-class facilities that we do offer. As the person who controls those resources, it is difficult for us to do. She's, and it was said in the Knud Janssen lecture, to implore the authorities to provide more resources. Our resources are limited. We have to make choices. We have to prioritize. It is not easy to do that. But with your assistance and the international expertise that has been brought to Cape Town, we will be able to do that. So Professor hans Paul and Mr. Barkley, thank you very much on behalf of the city of Cape Town. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the South African National Anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, leading the flag ceremony, we welcome Patrick Salepe, wheelchair tennis development officer, former professional wheelchair tennis, tennis player, and chair umpire. Ladies and gentlemen, now we welcome all ISPO national member societies.